of Special Education at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He earned his PhD in Special Education from Vanderbilt University, and his expertise addresses three areas related to the education of students with and at risk for developing emotional and behavioral disorders, including identification of evidence-based practices, training of school personnel to use, evaluate intervention effectiveness, and development of methods to ensure that effective interventions are implemented with integrity. Previously, Dr. Magan taught for three years in New York City public schools. He was a teacher in a self-contained setting with children in grades one through five, and primarily with students who had the greatest social, emotional, and behavioral needs. I will now turn it over to Dr. Magan. Thanks, Laura. Um, just one, uh, one check here. Uh, I have control of the PowerPoint. Yep, you can go ahead and advance the slides if you want to give it a quick test. Great. Uh, oh, there we go. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I know you guys all have busy schedules, and hopefully what we're going to talk about today is of some use to you. Um, so the emphasis of today's presentation is going to be on the procedures and some methods for monitoring student behavior within the database individualization process. And before reviewing those procedures, we're going to talk about the considerations that you need to take uh, for uh, contextualizing behavioral progress monitoring for specific students into the broader three-tiered model. Um, we're also going to um, begin with uh, taking a broader perspective on this and then consider the procedures for monitoring student behavior. And we will use a case example who we will call Jeff to illustrate how these tools and methods might be applied and conclude with some questions at the end. I'm actually going to stop intermittently uh, to see if there are any questions about uh, surrounding specific sections. So, um, and then we'll also have some time at the end, hopefully, for some follow-up. So, as Laura pointed out, type those questions into the box, and we'll address them as they come. So, I am sure by now that you are all familiar with this time in some form or another. And because we talk about it most often in regards to interventions, um, we're going to begin there. So the following slide, the one after this, is going to provide an illustration of the triangle logic within the context of, of assessment and database decision making. Within the context of intervention, however, which we're going to talk about here and start there because that's how everybody kind of frames the conversation, uh, we're going to start at the bottom. And I'm sure you guys are all fluent with this, but just bear with me for a moment because I'm going to use this kind of as a heuristic, and this is going to help us kind of frame the remainder of the webinar. So at the bottom, we have Tier 1, also called the Green Zone. Uh, so the logic of the triangle suggests that most kids, about 80%, are going to respond positively to strong systematic prevention techniques at this level. So those might include reminding students of the school rules, um, determining and uh, specifying what the classroom expectations are, and awarding tokens or tickets or simply just you know, some verbal praise for, to students for following these expectations. So remember, the reason we reward for appropriate behavior is to make the students aware that there will be positive consequences, not just negative consequences, but, but also positive consequences for being respectful and working hard, uh, which are obviously behaviors that we value in schools. Ultimately, having these preventative processes in place will improve the efficiency of the system by increasing, by increasing the number of students demonstrating positive pro-social behaviors and therefore reducing the number of students needing more intensive behavioral supports. So if we have a lot of students that need more intensive supports and, and are acting out more, uh, then that's going to require more time and energy on behalf of school personnel. So because we expect that about 80% of students are going to respond to these really you know, positive approaches and preventative measures at Tier 1, we obviously have about 20% of students that we anticipate will not be responsive. There we go. So these kids are going to, are going to require further support to maintain appropriate behavior. 
So the typical process, according to the three-tier model, is to move these non-responding students to an intervention that will provide additional feedback on student behavior and opportunities to access rewards and positive attention. So really, the, what we're talking about here is the logic is, is that we, we give, you know, uh, we, we specify what the school rules are, what the expectations are in the classroom. We ensure that we have some method of providing some feedback to the students on whether they're following those rules or not. And then for those kids that are not, continue to not follow the rules uh, or, you know, meet the expectations of the classroom, we then try to provide some extra support for them. And uh, that can take many different, um, uh, that can look differently for different kids. Um, but the first step that we take is having some institutionalized intervention there for, for them to be moved into. So this is our, <clears throat> typically called a secondary or tier two intervention. And in fact, the anticipated response rate for the secondary intervention is about 15%. So we expect about 15% of students to respond positively to this secondary intervention. And uh, so that leaves an additional 5% of students that have not been responsive to preventive or secondary intervention supports. So just to put it another way, these are the most challenging students. So what, what do we do for them? These are the students for whom we apply the data-based individualization process we're going to be talking about today. So it's important to remember that the DBI process is not applied to more than 5-7% of students. These are the most challenging kids. Because as you're going to see as we move across this process, and I, and I explain a little bit more what, what we're advocating for, you're going to see it's going to take a lot of time and energy. So we want to make sure that these um, that we have good preventative techniques and good secondary interventions in place to, uh, um, to be sure that we're targeting those students with the greatest need. All right, so that's the intervention logic. I'm, I'm sure you guys are all fluent on that. What does this look like for assessment, however, right? Because without assessment, without uh, assessment intervention, often we can't tell whether it's working or not. So that's why assessment is so important. So, <clears throat> so I use that to illustrate the underlying logic, the multi-tiered supports. And our focus today is going to be on learning the fundamentals and rationale of assessment and progress monitoring. Because the tri triangle logic is so useful for describing the intervention framework, we're also going to use it to describe the assessments that we use. So this is meant to impress on you the critical relationship between intervention and assessment. That's to say that assessment processes are needed to determine whether the intervention you have developed is working. So the data collection and evaluation procedures require just as much attention, if not more, than designing an intervention. For the, mo for the moment, though, let's just discuss what kind of data we collect at each of the three tiers. So at the first level of the triangle are the methods and tools used to determine whether a student is responding to preventive supports or not. These assessment procedures should be readily available for the entire student body and collected and reviewed systematically to, to identify those students who are not being responsive. This type of assessment is widely called a screener because it acts as a filtering system for students. Examples of these assessment methods include office discipline referrals or standardized screening instruments. The second type of assessment technique is progress monitoring, which is the collection of data targeting specific behaviors. So progress monitoring is used typically for, uh, is used at both tier two and tier three levels uh, because it allows for the effectiveness of the intervention on student behavior to be evaluated. That is to determine whether it is working or not. Although the purpose and procedures of the progress monitoring process is similar for tier two and tier three, there are some important differences, such as how often the data are collected and reviewed, and whether the focus of the data being collected relates back to school expectations, which would be the case for secondary level, or to an individualized behavior, which would be the tertiary or tier three level. So as you can see here on the slide, screening instruments are, are used to determine who's not responding to general supports in the environment. Those students that are moved to secondary interventions are then assessed on a weekly or monthly 
uh, basis on some kind of somewhat general um, assessment that's linked to the expectations. And then those kids that move to the tier three, we're really talking about individualized intervention. So we're talking about individualized assessment practices. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So now that we've placed behavioral progress monitoring within the context of three tier models, let's, let's formally define the process. So what, what really at the end of the day, what are we talking about? And after we defined it, we will move into considerations for carrying out the process within the DBI framework. As you can see from the definition, behavioral progress monitoring is more than simply collecting assessment data. Of course, the collection of data is important, but it is ultimately how the data are used that is most important. As such, behavioral progress monitoring also includes the evaluation of the data, which is used to determine whether the inter intervention is working or not. This general two-step process requires careful consideration of specific features of data collection and evaluation akin to the development of an intervention plan. So the development of meaningful individualized assessment processes requires careful planning to make sure that the data being collected address the specific needs of the student. These methods will be introduced and discussed in the following sections of the presentation where we begin to focus on planning for behavioral progress monitoring. All right, I'm just going to pause there for a second, and I'm going to illu illustrate that in a set, what we just talked about, but I just want to see if there's any questions up front. Laura, are there any questions? We don't have any questions in the chat box now, but this would be a great time if anyone has a question to go ahead and, and type it into the chat. So we'll give it one second. Doesn't look like anyone is starting to type, so we can, we can pause later on, but no questions at this point. Great. I'm going to keep checking back in. All right. So before we move any further, let's solidify or illustrate what this is going to look like. So we're going to use a case example. Example, Our buddy Jeff here. Um, so Jeff is a 12-year-old student who has consistently demonstrated disruptive behaviors in class. These behaviors include calling out, talking back, and interrupting peers. These behaviors prompted his enrollment in the school Tier 2 intervention program. And despite the extra supports, Jeff's disruptive behaviors have actually seemed to increase in frequency and intensity. As a result, Jeff's teacher, Ms. Coleman, has referred to the school team, has referred him to the school team. So we're going to follow Jeff through the planning and data collection and evaluation process to see how this might be applied to him. So the DBI process advocated by the NCII has a few underlying assumptions. The first is that the student has been systematically identified as not responding to Tier 1 or Tier 2 interventions. Systematic identification refers to the use of a pre-planned screening process, process that has a clear, well-articulated decision point for making referrals. So as you can see here, Jeff's school uses number of ODRs as an initial screen to identify students as eligible for intervention. The school leadership team has determined that student, students with two or more ODRs for two consecutive months would qualify for school-wide Tier 2 interventions. Clearly, Jeff has prov proven himself eligible for additional supports. So what you see here is that he's averaging approximately five, uh, four and a half ODRs a month for three straight months. And what you see in the, the red there is the average student. So he's clearly exceeding what the average student was, and he's meeting those predetermined uh, markers for non-response to prevent to uh, tier one. So then he's entered into the tier two program. Uh, and not only has Jeff been identified through the universal screening method, but he's also been non-responsive to the tier two intervention. So we see the tier two intervention was implemented in November. <clears throat> and so this system is in place for determining whether a student is eligible for the DVI program. So that's to say that the school has determined that students are not responding to the Tier 2 intervention if they continue to have more than two ODRs following the implementation of the intervention and do not demonstrate improvement in classroom behavior based on the number of points earned on the point sheet. The, te the team also defined that non-response to Tier 2 as earning fewer than 65% of points 
for eight of 10 days. So essentially, there's these pre-planned markers to say what is responsiveness, what is not, and Jeff has not met those. And this is an example of the point sheet that was used during tier two. Um, and as you can see, the, uh, the decision rule for the team was that he was gonna have to earn more than 65% of his points on eight of 10 days, as I just mentioned, and he has clearly not done that. So now we, um, now we can say, here is a candidate for the DBI process. So the point I'm trying to emphasize here is that in order to make this as easy, well, I guess it's never gonna be easy, but as efficient as possible, then you really wanna focus on having these structures in place up front. All right, so now um, we're gonna move. Dan, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Dan. It just seemed like this might be a good time to ask a quick question that just popped up after our last, uh, after our last check-in. But Great. we got the question, what were the interventions used, and I'm assuming for Tier 2, so what, what could have been some of those interventions used for Tier 2, and maybe how long were they used before it was determined that the student was non-responsive? That's a great question. Uh, I guess in this example, they are kind of, you know, uh, generic in, in mindset because we're really trying to focus on the assessments and the pre-planning that needs to happen up front. Uh, you know, and the progress monitoring that needs to happen at, at all three levels. And now we're going to enter into the, the uh, progress monitoring that needs to happen at the, at the tier three level. Um, but just examples, for argument's sake, of interventions that you might use would be, you know, the one that's commonly used within the PBIS framework is check-in, check-out. And that's a pretty flexible uh, set of procedures that includes Checking in with a kid in the morning, so a teacher or a, you know, some adult in the school meets with a student uh, at the beginning of the day, gives them their point sheet, the student then goes from class to class or period to period if they're in elementary school, you know, time point to time point, and they get feedback on whether they're following the rules or meeting the expectations of the classroom. And if at the end of the day, then they check out with an adult, and so let me just back up for a second. And the, uh, the feedback that they receive is essentially a point sheet, you know, that says you were, that, that is directly uh, linked to the school or classroom expectations. So you were respectful, you were working hard, you were keeping your hands and feet to yourself, you met these expectations, then you give them points, and then you say if you earn, say, 80% of your points, across the entire day at checkout, then you might get a reward. Reward might be verbal praise, it might be a token, it might be something more tangible, like, you know, uh, perhaps not, you know, maybe edibles or something like that. But uh, at the end of the day, then they get rewarded for, for, you know, following the rules, essentially. So they're getting consistent feedback across the day, and then they're getting some sort of reward for meeting those expectations. Um, so that's that's the typical example in the PBIS framework. There are, there are others, but for now, for the for the argument of this webinar, I really want I, I want to focus on the the pre-planning process and the assessments because it's it's a I think it's a part that gets overlooked very often. So uh, I think you know, um, but that that is that is an example. So now we're going to move on to the uh, Laura. Were there any other questions? Nope, that was the only question that we got so far. Thank you. Great, great. Keep them coming. So, um, so now we're going to talk about the individualized behavioral progress monitoring process, right? So now we've identified a kid that needs to go to Tier 3 or that could benefit from some further support. And what does this look like? Because this is really where – this can really be challenging. So <clears throat> uh, – so it's worth emphasizing that today's presentation is focused on the development of the measurement system as opposed to the selection of the intervention. Ultimately, both are needed to successfully address the needs of the students with intensive behavioral needs. However, the planning required to develop an individualized assessment system is often not considered. So that makes today's webinar essential for developing a comprehensive plan for individualizing 
assessment, and intervention practices. And what we're talking about is a, is a three-step process. So step number one is going to be identifying and selecting the target behaviors. Step number two is going to be developing the measurement system based on that pre-planning information. And then step three is going to be using that measurement system and evaluating whether the intervention has, uh, has worked or not. And then decisions that you might make from there. So, as discussed previously, behavioral progress monitoring is a three-part system of planning, data collection, and evaluation. Perhaps the most important part of this process is the development of a clear and concise plan for implementing it. Just as we recommend having a reason, purpose, and approach for developing individualized interventions, it's critical that a formal plan for data collection and evaluation be implemented. The pre-planning stages of the process will allow you to chart a course to determine whether the goals for the student are being met. This process will consist of three specific steps, including the identification of behavior to target, prioritizing which target behaviors should be addressed if there are several identified, because you, as you can imagine, kids with the most intense needs are going to present a variety of behaviors, and to make this most feasible, we're going to advocate for you guys to only to select a couple of behaviors to focus on. And then the third step is developing a definition for these behaviors, and that's going to be, then be used to develop the, the data collection tool. So it's important to remember that this process is going to be unique for each student. That's what makes database individualization both effective and also somewhat challenging. So step number one, identification of a target behavior. So a target behavior, so what is a target behavior? A target behavior refers to a specific behavior or set of behaviors that are being displayed by the student that are deemed inappropriate or dangerous or disruptive. Naturally, the first step of reducing the occurrence of these behaviors is to identify them so that they can be addressed directly. So this selection process requires the collection of some background information on the context and features of the behavior. So what does it look like? Uh, when does it occur? Uh, why, why does the student present the behavior? And then this information is going to be used then to not only develop your measurement system and the, the approach that you're going to use to actually collect the data, but it's also going to inform your actual selection of the intervention that you want to use. So as you can see, that these are tightly linked, these two concepts of intervention and assessment. Fortunately, there are several methods available for gathering some, inf some uh, uh, information uh, for selecting the target behaviors. So it is possible that school personnel might be able to identify the target behavior right off the bat, but we still believe that formalizing the process is important to increase transparency and obtain agreement across various stakeholders like parents or colleagues on the target behaviors of concern. And this is going to allow the teacher and leadership team to clearly articulate the behavior, which will facilitate the development of a formal definition of what that behavior look like, looks like. So examples of types of data to be collected at the outset. So this is part of the planning process. The run up to the development of the system uh, would include using some questionnaires and interviews, a behavioral checklist, anecdotal reports, and, and or direct observations. So time constraints are going to prevent me from describing the uses of each of these in, in, in depth, but I'm going to give a quick example of each uh, of how you might use them. And actually, the forms that Laura mentioned in the box to the right of the screen are actually uh, have to do with this portion of the talk. So in there, you're going to see the que an example of a questionnaire slash interview that you might use. Um, examples of, of a checklist that, that you can use uh, in, in addition to anecdotal reports and um, an example of what uh, of a direct observation method that you might use. So, uh, so those are there. So let's just talk broadly about these things. Um, so in terms of questionnaires and interviews, they can act similarly. It depends on really how you want to deliver them. 
right? So it's essentially a set of questions, 10 or so questions, that the teacher um, or the referring school person will fill out, and it's going to focus on aspects of the behavior. So what really, what are we looking at? What, pa what behaviors are inappropriate or dangerous or difficult to, to manage? And it's going to get a sense of what is the problem. A more formal approach, uh, which could also be used in conjunction, so I, I view the questionnaire as kind of a first pass of what the issue is. A more formal approach would be a checklist, and these come in two different forms. One is, uh, are, the, are the standardized checklists that often used for psychological evaluation, such as the BASC or the SSBD, uh, sorry, uh, the Behavioral Assessment Screener for Children, the Systematic Screen, uh, System, uh, excuse me, the uh, FSBD, uh, systematic screener for behavior disorders, and the like. So those are, you know, norm reference tests. So the one way that you might use those, if you if you have that data available, you can go through the items because they are essentially based on observable aspects of the of of student behavior. So you know. Does the student throw up a lot? Does the student interact with friends? Does the student, uh, you know, hit, scream, you know, act inappropriately? Uh, so you can use those items to help you identify which behaviors you might want to focus on. Um, there are also informal checklists, which are one of which is included in the uh, packet there. Um, and again, it's the same idea: is that it'll it'll prompt you to to check off a series of behaviors um, and give you just kind of ideas of how to define them, you know, topographically. So what do, what do they look like? Uh, so just going through those and then really using those responses to say, to identify which behaviors you want to focus on. In addition, you could use anecdotal reports, often in the uh, antecedent behavior consequent format, the ABC format. And what those are are typically uh, narrative, um, uh, narrative reviews of what the behavior was. So you, so you look at what occurs before the behavior, that's the antecedent event, what, sets, what triggers the behavior, then you describe the behavior, and then what immediately follows. And that's going to give you some information for selecting an appropriate intervention for that student. Uh, the final approach that you might use is once you've narrowed down a couple of behaviors, you might ask a colleague or the school psychologist to come in and do some direct observations in the classroom to, uh, to identify which uh, behaviors you might prioritize, because sometimes you know, behaviors such as fighting or screaming might seem like they're happening a lot, but they may be precursors, they, or sorry, they might be, uh, there, there might be precursors to those that you might want to address First, so uh, ultimately, you take all the information collected <clears throat> and you integrate it um, to de to determine those behaviors that are occurring most often. So, generally speaking, there should be some effort by the school team and classroom teacher to collect the background information to specify the behaviors. And regardless of the specific procedures used, these are just some examples of what you might use. The information obtained from these sources is then used to develop a list of key behaviors that might become the focus of the individualized intervention and assessment process. So successful integration of these methods requires examining the products in conjunction with each other to identify particular behaviors consistently cited as being problematic. So the goal here is to identify patterns across the tools to determine the features and context of the behavior. This information will subsequently be used when developing an approach for collecting the data. Any questions? Yes, we do have a question. Great. Um, someone asked, would you also include information that was gathered from a private provider or assessments that were completed outside of the school setting in your information gathering? You know, I think, uh, I think to understand the, the student, I think you certainly would use that information to understand where the student's coming from. What we advocate for here in the DBI process is, is really using information within the school. 
because you know each environment is going to be different, so the student might present different behaviors across environments. Um, if, if it's similar behaviors, then then you know fine. But if it's not, then you know we're really talking about addressing specific uh, behaviors that you can see within the context. Um, so I I think that outside information from from a from an external provider is certainly important and should be considered, uh, you know, should be considered in relation to the student and what you might choose to do for the student. But when you're developing the measurement system and the school-based intervention uh, for the individual student, I think it's best to work with the information that's available in that particular setting. So, let's just see how this might play out you know, with a, with a specific student. So we're going to return to our case example. We're going to return to Jeff. And uh, so after two months in the Tier 2 program, it was clear to Ms. Coleman and the school leadership team that Jeff was not responding. So remember, that's where we left off. So his ODRs and his point sheet totals did not reflect any improvement from the Tier 2. So now we really know he's a candidate for Tier 3. So the school team and Ms. Coleman were collaboratively get collaboratively to gather more information about specific features and context of the behavior and the behaviors that are so that uh, Jeff is admitting that are problematic. So specifically, Ms. Coleman filled out a questionnaire on Jeff's behavior per the school leadership team's request. They completed anecdotal reports uh, within the moment. Um, I, I said they, Ms. Coleman did, the teacher within the classroom. And she had a colleague come to observe Jeff's behavior five times over a two-week period for about 20 or 30 minutes each time, just to see once, once she had a, some, she identified some behaviors of concern, just to see how often these behaviors were occurring. So let's take a look at that. So the data collected, uh, let's see. So what you can see here, so following the identification of these behaviors, uh, from the target behavior questionnaire and anecdotal report, um, the school psychologist came in, and here are the behaviors that were identified. Jeff is out of seat a lot, he curses, he threatens, he fights, he argues, he hits and kicks, and he talks out. Now, a lot of these you could imagine happening around the similar instances, but, you know, the first wave through the questionnaire and the checklist, these are the behaviors that, ar that arose uh, of greatest concern. So then the the school psychologist came in to take a look at how often these are occurring. And, and what did they find? They found that threatening and cursing happened most often, whereas out of seat behavior and arguing and talking out, yes, they seem to be concerns, but they may not be, uh, they may not be the, the behaviors that you want to focus on initially. Right, so you always want to think about this process not as some sort of static, you know, what, what you do the first time is going to always be right. It, it might take some revisions. So, you know, you might focus on threatening. You might focus on cursing, but it might, over time, evolve into different behaviors. So, you, so, it, so it should be kind of a dynamic process that you're, you're continually revising. And that's, and that's really the benefit of progress monitoring is, is that it – it forces you to, to consider not only the data, but the, you know, what's happening with the kid, you know, continually, on a schedule, keep thinking about it. Not, not, not that you don't go home and think about the kid every single day, but that it, that it, uh, it prompts conversation around what, what's going on. So as you can see, threatening and cursing were the most prevalent, and uh, while arguing and talking out also were occurring at fairly high rates. So these behaviors were then considered for the prioritization process. So they took these four behaviors, uh, threats, curses, out of seat, sorry, threats, curses, arguing, and talking out, and they put them into the prioritization process. Now, the prioritization sheet, the one that we used, is also included in that packet. Um, so as you might imagine, right, this process might lead to the identification of several, several possible target behaviors for, for various kids. So, in fact, the data for the case example demonstrated this, this problem. Uh, there were four behaviors, cursing, threatening, hitting, and talking out, that were identified. So given that, we
we want to emphasize feasibility, it is necessary to carefully select those behaviors that will be targeted. This prioritization process requires considering each of the behaviors identified in the initial process and rating the extent to which they relate to school success. So as you'll see on that, on the accompanying information sheets, is that it's essentially 10 questions and then there's four, uh, well, there's four spots that you can put in four different behaviors uh, and you rank the behaviors or you rate the behaviors on a, on a, on a small scale from, from zero to three on their prevalence. So examples of questions that are asked on that. Does the behavior present danger to the student or others, right? Obviously those, those behaviors that are presenting any sort of potential for harm for those in the environment are going to be prioritized first. <laughs> um, other, can, other questions are how often does the behavior occur? Will changing the behavior allow the student to obtain more positive attention? So these are examples of questions that are, are rated, and then through that, then you obtain information uh, uh, on which one should be prioritized. So this is an example of a sheet that's concluded in the packet. <clears throat> and the result of those were that it was indeed that the, prior, that the um, threatening and cursing were rated to be the greatest priorities. So moving forward, we're going to focus on threatening um, for the rest of the presentation, but this is to illustrate that perhaps you know, the intervention should focus, the inter intervention that's developed should focus on two specific behaviors, cursing and threatening, and then the data collection system would have to, would be developed to reflect those behaviors. Moving forward, however, we're only going to focus on threatening. All right. So we've identified our behaviors. We've selected our behaviors. So now that we've done that, it is time to develop a clear definition of each. So what we're talking about is is developing an operational definition. And good operational definitions of target behaviors provide an accurate, complete, and concise description of the behavior to be measured. And this is really an important part of the DBI process. So this includes ensuring that the language used emphasizes objectivity. The definition should also allow for the behavior to be readily observed and measured. This is accomplished by using clear, concise language and constructing the definition in such a way that it can be readily applied by others. So that's to say that a colleague should be able to read the definition and be able to say, there it is, that is the behavior. A good definition of the target behavior will allow instances of the behavior to be readily identified and assist in the development of the measurement system. In addition to using objective language and stating the definition in measurable terms, it is also often necessary to clearly state which behaviors are included in the definition and which are not. So really the goal here is to, and is, to de, is to define the behaviors in such a way that we can get agreement across, across as many people as we can. We want to be able to say, ah, that is an instance of the, of the behavior and that is not. And the reason why we want that is because the more clear that we are in what we're looking for, the more uh, reliable our data is going to be. And the more reliable our data is, then the firmer and the more the the uh, the better our decision making can be. So, here's an example of target behaviors definitions. So for Jeff, um, so Jeff had two behaviors, although one of them was was different. But we'll we'll uh, we'll ignore that for a moment. So hitting and kicking were one of the behaviors or might be a behavior that was of concern. So Jeff will be considered to be hitting or kicking if his foot or hand makes contact with another student with the intent to cause harm. The physical contact must be initiated by Jeff and put forth with sufficient intensity to cause harm to the intended target. Hitting and kicking will not include instances in which Jeff accidentally touches a student with his hand or foot. So again, we want to be as clear and as concise as possible about what we're looking for. And once we can do that, then we can collect better data. And another example of, of a, 
operational definition is threatens. So threats mean verbal statements that refer to harming other people, including peers or teachers. This includes statements such as, I will throttle you or I will knock you out, but will not include statements such as, I said, leave me alone, or other statements indicating an attempt to cope with the situation. So you might imagine that a student is, becomes frustrated with the situation and that they say, leave me alone in an aggressive way, right? Now, some people might say out of context that that's, you know, that, that, that is a threat taken out of context. But, uh, but, be, but, but, but defining it as clearly as we have here, then we know that, you know what, we're not going to say that that's an instance of threatening because that is actually you know, an attempt for Jeff to cope with the situation in a more uh, desirable way than, than threatening another student. So as you can see, these definitions reduce subjectivity and increase the likelihood of agreement across different people, including teachers, prepare professionals, and other school personnel, so that we can get a real good idea of how often the behavior is occurring. All right, so now this is where the rubber meets the road. So we use the definitions and the, the pre-planning information to develop a measurement system. Now, just before we go into what that's going to look like, and we're going to review those, the various methods associated with collecting the data, but first it's worthwhile to discuss some considerations for developing an effective approach to measuring behavior. So remember that progress monitoring for students that need individualized behavioral support requires data to be collected more often, right? So if you remember back to the initial slide with the triangle, is that right? We had screening information to, to identify kids based on the broader school population. And then we moved those kids into tier two and or tier three, and we progress monitor uh, more close, uh, more specific behaviors um, on a, on a uh, more specific behaviors more often. So. Because of this, the teacher and school team has to consider the most appropriate schedule for, for, uh, to review the collected data. So is daily assessment needed, or would it be more helpful to have data collected on a weekly basis? Other questions to consider relate to who will collect the data and at what times. It is also necessary to consider the design and the procedures for ensuring the data are inputted and how often they're going to actually be looked at for evaluation. So most of these steps will be clear following the identification of the target behaviors and conditions of, of, of greatest concern. So, so as you're going through the initial run-up and uh, pre-planning period, sorry, the planning period, uh, you should be thinking about, you know, who's going to be inputting the data? How often are we going to look at it? You know, is this, if it's a really dangerous behavior that happens a lot, you know, like self-injurious behavior, for, for example, you might want to look at... Uh, that behavior on a daily basis to say, did we get a decrease on that? Whereas, you know, disrupt, you know, disruptive behaviors may be on a more of a weekly basis. If they're not quite so dangerous, if they're not happening quite so often, so your, uh, the student, in order to make this as individualized as possible, is the student's information and case is going to dictate how, what, or is going to dictate those decisions. But these are just things to consider when, when moving up. So, data collection methods that we typically use. So, specifying the time and place for data collection and the individual charged with collecting and entering the data is important in developing a comprehensive approach, but the data still need to, to actually be collected. So there are many approaches to data collection available, and each has its own strengths and limitations. The traditional method for collecting student behavioral data is through systematic direct observation. So the primary advantage of this set of techniques is that it leads to a direct representation of how often or how long or how intense the behavior is occurring. Despite this benefit, though, systematic direct observation can be extremely challenging to carry out accurately in the classroom while trying to attend to you know, 25 or 30 kids, deliver instruction, and manage behavior all at the same time. Because of these challenges, our emphasis here will be on using an emerging technology called direct behavior rating, 
which increases the practicality and ease of data collection without sacrificing the quality of the data. Specifically, we're going to consider how to incorporate the target behaviors into, existing, into the existing tool and use them in conjunction with standard behavior, behaviors included to the standard form. So we're, we're going to introduce this uh, d direct behavior rating. And systematic direct observation, uh, as a side note, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a technique that is extremely flexible and it gives you really useful information. However, we, you know, it, as, as I mentioned, it can be really difficult to carry out in the moment. So we're going so to use the direct behavior rating. So we call this DBR for short, uh, and it can be adapted to focus on a range of target behaviors while also providing an opportunity to measure broader, more general outcomes. So the premise of DBR is based on the idea that teachers can reliably and accurately rate student behavior on a continuum following some specified period of time. So these ratings are then used as the data to monitor student progress. There are actually several different DBR-like tools currently being developed and in use. And these include methods using multiple items to rate student performance and those using a single item scale. So we're going to use the one that, um, but we're, we're, we're going to talk about the one, uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll introduce that in a second. But it's worth noting that, these ver that the various tools are at different stages of development. So the one we're going to talk about is the single item scale, single item form. And, uh, so this, these, uh, the method, so this is the method with perhaps the greatest research to date. Uh, and it was developed by Sandy Shafulius and Chris Riley Tillman and others, um, and through a couple of uh, Department of Education research grants. Uh, and you can go to directbehaviorratings.com, I believe, .org, excuse me, .org, um, to download the, this information. So, and it's on the slides there, is the, uh, on the lower right hand side, we, we got these, a lot of this content f directly from them, from their website. So you can go to their website and, uh, you know, a lot of this con content is there and they have downloadable forms. So, with that out of the way, this particular approach allows the user to rate the behavior on a single continuum from 0 to 10. Right? So these numbers are anchored by terms such as the behavior will never, uh, never occur during the observation session, sometimes it occurred, or it always occurred during the observation session. Uh, observation session. As you can see, the completion of the form does not require constant recording or attention to paperwork work like systematic direct observation would, but rather allows you to instruct and manage freely while also providing a research-based method for tracking student behavior. So as I mentioned before, the, uh, the DBR single item scale comes with three intact behaviors. Uh, these include academic engagement, disruptive behaviors, and respectfulness. The advantage of having these three behaviors on the standard form is that not only will you be able to track the target behavior, that we're going to talk about how to uh, develop the form specifically for the target behavior that, we, that we've identified. Uh, but then you also have uh, the ability to track these broader, more general outcomes uh, that are needed for school success. So we're going to consider the application of these examples and then discuss how to incorporate the individualized target behavior for your students onto the instrument. Although we will review the information here, we strongly encourage interested districts to visit the DBR website uh, for their full DBR training and printable materials, particularly because we are going to focus on the use of DBR for the individualization process and not the use of the generalized measures here. However, I will say that uh, the academic engagement uh, and, the non and the disruptive and the respectful behavior scale uh, items are important to collect because, right, so you might be focusing on threatening, cursing, hitting, kicking, scratching, biting, one of those or several of them. <clears throat> and what is also nice to know, and we're, which is going to be illustrated in, in a few minutes, is, okay, so we, we're getting a reduction in hitting, 
but are, is it also having an impact on academic engagement or disruption? So knowing that will then allow you to go and perhaps revise the intervention uh, or adapt it specifically to other behaviors of concern, more general behaviors that uh, might relate more directly to school success. So the standard DBR items are useful for tracking whether a student is being responsive to broad indicators of school success. However, the database individualization process will require the tracking of behaviors specific to the particular student. This will require school personnel to clearly define the target behaviors, which we've already done for Jeff, and align them, and align them with specific criteria to increase the consistency of the ratings. The ratings on the DBR are based on a 10-point scale, which, with each point reflecting a different level of occurrence for the behavior. The scale can then be interpreted as either the frequency of occurrences, that is, how often or how seldom, or the percentage of time in which the behavior might have occurred during that session. So did it happen sometimes, all the time, none of the time, et cetera. Here's how you might develop DBR anchors, right? You're going to use the pre-planning information to anchor each of the 10 points uh, on the scale. So here's an example of how we're going to do that. So the operational and the operational definition would be for Toby here is Toby's aggression is defined as the use of any behavior that involves making contact with others with an intent to injure or harm. This includes punching, hitting, kicking, spitting, scratching, pushing, and biting. This does not include patting on the back or shaking hands. So, so this is so the behavior. So the the definition uh, was co was devised based on the collection of the pre-planning data and the prioritization, and and then you know and then we came up with the operational definition. So now we want to know how often uh, the behavior occurred. So part of this, actually, was that to so Toby's data, uh, we did some direct observations in the classroom, and we, sh and we found that he was occurred that during math. And so we found that his behavior was occurring sometimes at zero. Right? Sometimes he would never be aggressive, and sometimes it occurred as many as t 12 or 15 times. So we linked those that range of uh, uh, occurrences to the scale, so sometimes, right? So, so a low occurrence would be zero, or you know, one on those scale would be a one or a two, all the way up to more than ten was considered high. So then the teacher teaches, and for math, and then after math class, as quickly as possible, rates the student. Right? Takes a moment to rate the student on the ten point scale, and then that data is then used as the basis for uh, uh, determining whether the student is responsive or not. So here you'd see that a three rating would be Toby displayed aggression for 30% of the math class, so which would be somewhat low for, for Toby. So here's another example of what the, the uh, DBR form might look like for, uh, for Jeff. So took his information, threats refer to verbal statements that refer to harming other people, right, put it right in there, and then took the observational data and, <clears throat> again, linked it di directly to the points on the scale. So just some considerations for implementing the DBR. Uh, it's important to review the definitions and anchors to ensure that you're applying them consistently. Because if, if there's not consistent application, then um, – then, you, then you're not sure what's really in, what the data is going to tell you. So just being sure that the that the definition is being applied consistently and the tools being applied consistently, and then have, always having the form ready to be completed after the observation session, and then completing ratings immediately after the pre-specified time. So and that's going to again, rather than looking back, you know, three hours later on math class, that's going to allow that's going to increase your ability to recall and clo closer to the to the moment all right let's pause there and then we're going to round into the final section uh any questions laura yep we had a few questions uh come Wait. up 
Uh, one was whenever you were talking about the um, conducting observations, someone asked how much time was used for gathering the frequency of the student behavior. So I guess during the observation, how much, um, generally yeah. how much time would that take? And I'll, I'll tell you what the other two questions are, just so you know, you might want to answer these at the end. Mm -hmm. One was asking about, um, they said, we have a computerized, computer-based tier three intervention program. Do you know anyone who has computerized this progress monitoring approach? And then maybe Swiss. And then someone else asked, what is Swiss? So those could be good. Yes, I will actually, just at the end, if you could remind me of those, uh, of, of those questions, I will uh, certainly address those at the end um, because that, um, I want to elaborate a little bit on that. But the, uh, uh, the first question was how long, you know what, it's going to depend on the behavior. Cause, so if you have a behavior that occurs frequently, then your observation period will, might have to be, uh, you know, might take less time. Uh, so that you can get, you know, enough occurrences to, to say, you know what, hey, you know what, I have a pretty good read on how often that behavior is occurring. Uh, the, uh, but for behaviors that occur, you know, less frequently, then you might have to spend a little bit more time in the classroom defining, or not defining, but observing them and seeing how often they occur. So it's really going to be based on the behavior, right? It's always got to be, you know, an if-but question. You know, no, there's there's no black and white around here. There's only, there's only gray. So, uh you know, letting the behavior dictate to you how often uh, it, or how long an observation session, how many, uh, I think is, is the right approach. Um, but, but thinking about it in terms of how often it occurs can be a useful consideration. So moving into the last form here. So what do you do with the data once you've collected it, right? So we have a, we have a bunch of information uh, in uh, uh, you know, collected and we've put it into Excel or into or into some or into Swiss or whatever. So the data collected from the DBR form will, will then be used to evaluate whether students are responding to the in intervention or not. So evaluation consists of analyzing the DBR uh, the DBR data to determine whether students are making progress toward the predetermined goals. So this process requires the DBR information has to be managed and organized in a way that supports summary and analysis, and because the DBR data will be collected on individual students, the most straightforward approach for displaying data is going to be in a line graph. So this process is going to be described in the following slides. And I think in the, in the package of materials on the right-hand side there is an Excel spreadsheet to help people with graphing that may not have, you know, either expertise or experience with it. Um, it it's somewhat crude at this, at this point. I think we're going to, you know, work on making it better. Um, but there are also other applications, you know, there's a graph dog through interventioncentral.com that's also useful, but, uh, you know, line graphs is what we advocate for because it's their, uh, you know, they, they display the information. You can make decisions based on that. So, again, right, we always want to think about up front, wh what are we going to do with the data? So, move it, so one, the first consideration is how we're going to move the data from the DBR form into the graph, right? Who's going to do it? How often are we going to look at it, and uh, and actually who is going to look at it? Is it going to be the leadership team? Is it going to be the, is it going to be the classroom teacher? Is it going to be a combination of people? So, those are considerations. So, uh, so begin with uh, so let's see here. So once the process for input inputting data has been outlined, right? So once you have an idea of who is going to input it, who's going to look at it, it's necessary to pilot the tool and begin to establish how the indiv individual is currently performing on the tool before intervention has begun. So essentially, what we want to get a baseline read on the behavior. So the purpose of this try it out phase is to make sure the DBR anchors and ratings are reflective of the student behavior and to determine a, pr a present level of functioning, right? So again, a baseline level. There's no set rules for how long this phase needs to be but there needs to be enough information to determine whether the tool is accurately reflecting student behavior. The general recommendation is five or more assessment points. Indications of problems with the tool might be the collection of data that are in, so, so the ways that you may think or may identify whether the tool is problematic uh, is that if the data you're getting are inconsistent or there's no clear pattern, uh, in such cases, it might be necessary to revise the definition or the anchors. 
to make sure that the instrument is providing accurate information. Make sure the assessment is providing accurate information. So not only will testing of the DBR tool provide information on whether it is accurately reflecting student behavior, but it's also, it will also provide a basis for comparing student behavior once the intervention has been implemented. So this test period also provides a basis for the school team to determine what responsiveness will mean for the student and decide when to retain, remove, or revise the intervention procedures. Because the database individualization process is, a unique, is unique to each student, there are no firm rules regarding what constitutes responsiveness, uh, but whether a student is responding will depend on the target behavior and the initial level. So if you have a really high rate, then you know, maybe, maybe getting some traction on lower, uh, on, on slightly lower. So if you have tens across the board based on the DBR, maybe, maybe it is meaningful change to, to see sevens. And then if you can cons consistently see around sevens, and then you, then you think about, you know, do we have to increase the intensity of the intervention? Do we have to change it in some way? So this is really, the, this information gives you the point for making the decisions. And again, there's no firm rules. There's nothing that we can say that is going to work for every student at this point. But, uh, but really just looking at the data and trying to interpret it as best as you can. And, and thinking always in terms of, should we revise the intervention? Should we remove the intervention, or should we keep it in, in, in uh, keep it in place? Should we retain the intervention? So, in terms of developing intervention goals, so it's important to specify the amount of time the intervention must be in place before revising. So, saying right, so if you implement an intervention, it's not working in the first three days. That may not be uh, a point to a point to um, remove the intervention unless you see drastic disimprovement in the in the behavior, drastic, you know, deterioration in the behavior. Um, but being clear up front about, you know, we're going to give this shot, we're going to give this a shot for six weeks and see what happens. And, you know, because over time, you know, more the, once the intervention's applied more consistently, then you might be able to see some uh, some movement and, and make better decisions. Um, it's also, again, it's, it's important to link the intervention goals directly to the DBR anchors and the behaviors that, that you've identified and prioritized. And the goals should not be seen as static. They, can, they should change and evolve over time depending on, on how the student is responding. So here are a, a series of graphs that just show how you might make these decisions. So you see the pre-intervention data here. The line means that there was an intervention, and then you see some post-intervention data for a while. Right, so that's after the intervention was implemented. As you can see here, uh, this is disruptive behaviors, uh, and that's on the DBR rating. So you'd expect a decrease in disruptiveness following the intervention. Mm, you know, just taking a look at this data, it might be inconclusive. I would, I would probably say, you know what, let's get another week of data and see whether it's still inconclusive. But you know, uh, giving you the basis to um, to make those, those decisions. Graphing the data gives you the basis for making those decisions. So here's just Jeff's data on the threatening day, on the, on the uh, threatens. The school team picked a pretty successful intervention for reducing the rate of aggression, of threats. As you can see, there was a pretty sharp change right when the intervention was in place, and it seems to be going down, continuing to go down. However, when we look at the engagement data, right, those broader items on the single item scale, uh, you see, you know, maybe that maybe the intervention has to be tweaked a little bit to increase to get some traction to get on uh, Jeff's engagement. So to get that to increase a little bit, as you might expect, with decreases in threats, there's probably also decreases in disrupt in general disruptiveness, which is also seen in Jeff's data. But you know what? Maybe it's not at the level that we would be that we would be uh, you know, happy with. So again, this might be give you reason to say, you know, we have to revise the intervention, or perhaps, you know, and and by revision it might be increasing the intensity of the intervention or choosing different, uh, uh, a totally different technique. So, I know I'm a little bit over time. It usually happens with me. So, <laughs> what are the takeaways here? So. 
One is that developing an approach to behavioral progress monitoring for this group of kids that needs the most intensive supports that we can, we can uh, develop, it, it requires a lot of hard work. You know, it, it, it's the pre-planning and it's the thinking carefully about which behaviors you want to prioritize and identify and how, do I, and how to define them and how to create a tool that's really going to relate to their behaviors. It, it really takes time and thoughtfulness. And that, and that is a way of saying that we want to make sure that there's good tier one, tier two behavioral supports in place so that we can be as efficient as possible, so that we only have to address you know, as few students as possible. On a related note, we only want to be doing this, right, the DBI process, for only 3 to 5% of the students. So if there's more than that, if you see 12 or 15% of students coming in on that require the DBI process, then you need to go back or we would, we would uh, advocate for you to go back and take a careful look at the Tier 1 and Tier 2 uh, interventions. And the final takeaway uh, is that there's a need, right, so we always think about intervention and, and uh, personalizing interventions, individualizing interventions, but just as important as individualizing those assessments and, and making sure that the interventions address the behaviors of greatest concern. And in order to understand whether those are working or not, is to develop assessment strategies that really address those underlying, uh, those, those behaviors of greatest concern. So I'm going to pause there. There's the disclaimer that nothing I said is actually supported by the Department of Education. But uh, so I'm going to return quickly to the, um, uh, to the question on SWIFT. So SWIS is the school-wide information system, and it's a method for collecting data. And it's, uh, it was developed out of the University of Oregon in conjunction with the National Center for Positive Behavior Intervention Supports. And it's a, um, uh, it, it provides a basis for collecting you know, an array of behavioral data. For example, office discipline referrals. And it really gives a, a really nice system for collecting who, what, when, where, and how, and then you take that information and you, you know, you apply your decision rules. So there's, you know, kid, kids that are having two or three or more uh, ODRs a month, and those might be the kids that are candidates to move to tier two, and then you know, uh, interventions. So that's SWIFT. Um, in terms of behavioral progress monitoring, I know that they recently developed uh, a program called ISIS which I don't recall what it stands for, but I have been treated to a, uh, a, uh, uh, an overview of it, you know, a demonstration of it, and it is very, in my opinion, it's very impressive. I think it's an excellent way to mo monitor student progress, and I believe that ISIS is developed uh, specifically for uh, kids um, at, at Tier 2 and, and Tier 3. So it's not for the general population, but it's for those kids with, you know, that need greater support. So I hope that, that addressed that question. Um, Laura, any, any others? No, not at this time. I, I believe that you kind of answered whether or not um, anyone else has developed a computerized progress monitoring approach. That definitely... Um, the ISIS system within SWIS is, and, it, and it's relatively new, still being rolled out. So yes, and and also the DBR developers also have a progress monitoring system, which the name is escaping me. I, I want to say it's Basis. Uh, so, but if you go to their website at directbehaviorratings.org, uh, they should have uh, a link to, to a progress monitoring, uh, a computerized progress monitoring tool. Great. We will uh, post that specific name in our, um, we'll post that specific name in our Q&A. Great. All right. We may have one more question. I will um, just start to wrap up with some quick announcements. Just in case you didn't already check out the handouts that are posted on the right-hand side of the screen, you may click on those and download those at any time. Um, our survey link is in the chat box 
um, on the top of the screen, and your computer will also be rerouted to it at the end of the presentation. We really appreciate your responses because they help us to uh, shape our future presentation, so we'd really appreciate that. Um, it looks like that's all the questions we have, so thank you so much, Dr. Magan, and thank you to all of those who joined us today. As a reminder, the webinar will be archived on our website, and the PowerPoint will be posted along with the Q&A document with uh, answers to all of the questions. And if we didn't get to your question today, which I believe we got to most of them, um, it will be included in the Q&A document. So we have the great, is, uh, we just got a question from Linda, let us know, go back to the slide with the presenter's name. Okay, great. <laughs> so uh, next month we will have a webinar in May on using the NCII tools charts presented by Dr. Allison Gandhi. So thank you everyone for joining today and this concludes our webinar. Thanks everyone.